New body camera video is released less than a week after a controversial and deadly police shooting. Protesters demonstrated again tonight. Eyewitness News reporter Leanne Suter live in Pasadena with a look at that video. Yeah, Mark, protesters have been gathering every night since that fatal shooting on Saturday. Today, the police department releasing body cam video in an effort to be fully transparent. What? Stop right there! A deadly police shooting caught on camera as a Pasadena officer opens fire on a fleeing suspect. 32-year-old Anthony McLean was a passenger in a car pulled over for a traffic stop Saturday night. The driver cooperating as McLean took off running. The officers noticing he had a gun, one officer firing two shots. As the individual did look at him, and so the officer fired likely because he was worried the individual was probably going to turn to fire at him. Authorities say a weapon was recovered at the scene is now being tested for fingerprints and DNA. The department releasing the video as the investigation continues into the officer-involved shooting. <laughs> Protesters continuing to call for justice. Some say the video isn't so clear-cut, the weapon not clearly visible in his waistband. It looks more like um, he was shot because he was fleeing and less of that he was a threat. Those two deputies are fighting for their lives this morning as officers across Los Angeles conduct a manhunt for the shooter. And while they don't have him in custody yet, they have released this video of the attack. And we have to warn you, it's disturbing. Overnight, a cowardly ambush on the streets of Compton, California. A gunman walks up to a patrol car with two sheriff's deputies inside and opens fire before running from the scene. 10-4, copy 998, deputy shot. Stand by for a GSW, be a deputy involved. They were both critically injured, multiple gunshot wounds. The two deputies now out of surgery. One is a 31-year-old mother of a 6-year-old boy. Her partner is a 24-year-old man. They just graduated, and in fact, I swore them into office just 14 months ago. The deputies were able to radio for help and give a partial description of the shooter as a dark-skinned male. The suspect is still at large. I've seen some just walk up and just start shooting on them. It, it's, uh, it pisses me off. James Farr here, live from Pasadena Media Studios. Get ready for more piercing and provocative. The Conversation Live starts now. And welcome to another episode of The Conversation Live. The Conversation Live focuses on social justice, restorative justice, inclusion, and equality. Coming up today, Jackie Lacey and George Gascon are both in the seat. We're gonna have a critical and possibly uncomfortable conversation. I wanna talk with both of them about their record as district attorney, both in San Francisco as well as Los Angeles. We wanna discuss why voters should be casting the ballot for them this November 3rd. Also, I wanna take a look at a couple of officer-involved shootings as well as their understanding of A, B, 392, and we want to talk about the alleged executioner gang out of the Compton Los Angeles Sheriff's Department Division. Uh, let's go ahead and welcome uh, Mr. Uh, Gascon into the seat first, and uh, we'll talk with him. Mr. Gascon, how are you, sir? James, I'm doing very well. Thank you. Good. How about I'm, yourself? I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, under these difficult and certainly challenging times that, we, you know, societally we're facing, uh, but one of the things I wanted to, to talk with you, we kind of saw Chief, excuse me, the sheriff make those very passionate comments following the blue line ambush of two deputy sheriffs uh, who seamlessly were just doing their job. Why is it that we don't see that level of passion from either a district attorney or sheriffs, police chiefs, when unarmed African American, unarmed citizens? are gunned down by the police. What's your take on well, that? Well, I, uh, yeah, I, I think, look, I mean, first of all, you, it depends, right? Because I have been very outspoken in some of those issues, including some of the shootings in my own uh, jurisdiction, where I felt that the shooting was completely unnecessary and prompted me to be the only district attorney in the state to work on state law to actually change the way that we look at the shootings. But I think that the, you know, the, the problem that we often see is the the sort of the divide that exists between law enforcement in, in many segments of our community 
and and that us against them that is completely uh, overtaking the dialogue in so many places. I mean, look, even if you look at a police publication like the LAPD uh, Police Protective League, the the title of the, the the publication is a thin blue line, mm -hmm. right? It, it's a culture that feeds into creating a division, um, and you know, some lives are more valuable than another, right? And that that I think it it raises the problems that you pointed out, instead of saying, you know what, violence, regardless of the source of it, uh, is unacceptable, it should be uh, passionately opposed, and that we should be caring for people, regardless of whether they happen to be in uniform or not. Then I think that that is a problem that we have today. And, you know, it points out to what, what you very obviously see. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we, we often see or hear in media, uh, even me, the media, and I'm a part of it, but there's this humanization of the officers. And I, I do not condone the violence. I'm not with that. But there's this humanization process that just simply isn't uh, afforded to uh, uh, victims of violence when the police are behind it. I mean, as, as district attorney, is that language that you're going to work to uh, kind of correct and change? The, the, you know, it's not only language that I would work to correct in LA if I were to, uh, to be honored with the voters uh, be electing me, but, uh, you know, we did that in San Francisco. We started having a very different conversation about the way that we refer to people in the system because I think language matters. I think that when you uh, consistently try to... Um, you know, point out to the the other party as someone that re deserves less humanity or less respect than you do. Then that that process of the dehumanizing people um, obviously um, brings about the divisions and the problems that we have. So language definitely matters, and and it's something that, by the way, I think we all have to work on it. Right? I think it's you know it's like implicit bias. You know, sometimes you even say things. And you go back and say, should I have used a different language? And I think that, that the racing the bar in that conversation is really important for all of us. Mm -hmm. Let's let's I want to switch up because I want to talk a little bit about uh, AB three uh, three ninety two. Let's go ahead and roll in this uh, next clip so we can bring the audience up to speed. And I want to talk to you about some hypotheticals around AB three ninety two. Some Democratic lawmakers in California want to make it the first state to significantly restrict when police officers can open fire. The proposed legislation is in direct response to last month's deadly police shooting of Stephon Clark. He was not armed at the time. Carter Evans is at the California State Cap Capitol with more on this story. Carter, good morning to you. Good morning. Lawmakers want to raise the standard for when police can use deadly force from when it's considered to reasonable to only when it is absolutely necessary to preserve human life. They believe that'll encourage officers to defuse more situations, but others believe it could put police lives in danger. Do not underestimate the power of grief. Tensions remain high in Sacramento more than two weeks after the police shooting of 22-year-old Stefan Clark. At a city council meeting Tuesday, community members demanded answers and action. You better give us justice because you're damn sure not ready for what comes next. Those cries for justice and reform have now spread from Sacramento City Hall to the state capitol. In the six seconds between the time officers called out to Stefan Clark and opened fire, current California law required them to determine whether the use of deadly force was, quote, reasonable. But the new law would require them to determine whether it's not just reasonable, but necessary. And welcome back. Now, George, you, if you recall in the top of the show, we uh, we showed some footage of uh, officer involved shooting on August 15th. 32 uh, year old African-American male Anthony McClain was fatally shot by a Pasadena police officer. Um, you know, as the district attorney, when you're evaluating whether or not, you know, a shooting is justified, what factors are you looking at based on those factors? And that how would that influence your decision to criminally charge an officer? Yeah, and you know, it's a, the, I'm so glad that you asked uh, this question, James, because also we are now at a point, right, where we have a new legislation that creates a different path to review these cases. It used to be 
without getting too lawyerly, you had the reasonable officer standard and you had the reasonable person standard and it was a combination of a subjective and objective uh, standard that often gave very wide berth to when an officer gets to use deadly force. Um, the new law, which by the way, I was the only district attorney that, that, that supported the law and actually on the early stages when it was minimum and necessary. And you know, police lobby worked really hard and district attorneys to get rid of the minimum part of it. Uh, so we have a, a new standard that is called necessary. It has not been tested by the courts, uh, but I, the way I interpret it, and I, if I were to be elected, I plan to take a very robust look at this, would be that in evaluating the totality of the circumstances, was a shooting necessary? Were there other things that could have occurred uh, in order to avoid the shooting? And uh, I think that it's going to be very important for district attorneys to take a very, very broad view of this policy and this new law, if you will, and, and see how the courts are going to react to, to that interpretation. I can tell you that there are very different points of view here, right? I think that the people in the civil rights community believe that this is going to make it uh, easier to prosecute cases where officers use force that shouldn't have been used. And, and I know that many people on the police uh, line, the legal side, they're telling police officers, don't worry about it, nothing has changed. So it really is gonna be a very interesting process as we move forward in the next well, few years. When, when you look at that uh, uh, critical incident video that was released by the Pasadena Police Department, I mean, do you have an opinion uh, now that was it necessary? Yeah, you know, I and again, I I want to caution that I obviously I don't have all the all the information before and after. And sometimes, you know, law enforcement like human beings try to do we try to paint things in the most favorable possible light to our point. So we're seeing a guy that you know appears to have a gun and he's running away. But I think a question that you have to ask is, is it simply because someone is running away with a gun with no additional information? I mean, we don't have any information. He shot anyone, that he killed anyone, that he's about to kill anyone. Is that enough to open fire and use deadly force, especially in a society where we have so many guns? And, you know, people often have guns that they are authorized to have. Um, so I would say that I would look at that video and I have a lot of questions of whether that was a necessary shooting. Okay. Uh, I want to transition a little bit more because we're going to power through this. Um, I want to talk about Black Lives Matter and your relationship to uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, Los Angeles, and uh, kind of get some feedback. I got to go, got to call this last, this next clip up. It's uh, District Attorney Jackie Lacey's husband and an interaction with uh, Black Lives Matter's organizers at her home. Let's roll that in, Jared. Get off of my porch right now. Get off. Good morning. Get off of Are you my porch. Shoot me? I will shoot you. We are told that that was David Lacey back on March 2nd. State Attorney General Javier Becerra has charged him with three misdemeanor counts of assault with a firearm. Jackie Lacey later apologized on his behalf, saying that there had been several threats on their lives. Lacey faces a tough re-election race in November. Several prominent politicians have either rescinded their support or have endorsed her opponent, George Gascon. Well, D.A. Lacey issued a statement which reads, in part, protesters arrived at my house shortly after 5 a.m. while I was upstairs. My husband felt that we were in danger and acted out of genuine concern for our well-being. Melina Abdullah, who was one of the people threatened, also released a statement saying, Anyone else who pulled a gun because they were agitated then spoke the words, I will shoot you, would have been immediately arrested and charged with. And that clip closes out charged with a felony. Do you think those charges were warranted, George? Well, and, and you know, I, I want to be circumspect only to the to the ask that I don't want anybody to accuse me of trying to influence the jury decision here. But I have to agree with the with the statement that was made by Dr. Abdullah that you know most other people, certainly in LA County, would have been immediately arrested uh, if they pointed a gun at a group of people. The question is, um, you know, is the level of prosecution adequate in this case? I, you know, again, I don't know uh, the record of Mr. Lacey. There's a lot of information that I don't know, so I don't want to second guess the Attorney General at this point. But I do agree with the statement that was made by Dr. Abdullah that most people in this county would have been arrested and certainly uh, they would have been filed uh, for pointing a gun at other people. Okay. 
Um, there have been to date about 622 um, people that have been killed by police in the county since uh, Deputy, excuse me, District Attorney Lacey has taken uh, office. Do you plan to reopen any cases and kind of reevaluate and see if charges should be filed when you're in office? And if so, can you be specific? Yeah, so, and I, you know, I want to be very careful because I don't want to have myself being conflicted out if I get uh, elected, but I have a group of civil rights attorney that are part of my uh, team. Uh, and we're looking at cases that we believe that uh, the, the circumstances surrounding the, the shooting uh, certainly deserve a second look. And the commitment that I have made to the community is one that if uh, that group of individuals feels that there are cases there that should be proceeded with, meaning they should be a, a criminal filing, I will appoint a special prosecutor, meaning someone, a lawyer with experience in this work outside of the office that will be completely empowered to act on my behalf, but not at all um, tied down to the office of the district attorney's office uh, to proceed with a case. So there are cases that we're taking a look at. I'm sure there will be other cases as community members uh, bring other cases to our attention. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, that that is important that we do that kind of work. Okay. I know Ms. Lacey has a lot of resources and millions of dollars at her uh, disposal. And uh, it comes from the police associations, you know, they've already spent millions of dollars to uh, try to help reelect her. How do you plan uh, plan to overcome that? You know, what's your pathway to victory? Yeah, you know, so we are very grassroots. Uh, you're absolutely right. Police unions put about $2.2 million to support Ms. Lacey during the uh, primary. And we have been told that there will be somewhere between four and $5 million that will come to her aid. Uh, probably most of that being, uh, you know, put into action in the last couple of weeks of the election. Uh, we have, you know, we, we have a lot of people, you know, we have over 700 volunteers. We have a lot of organizations that are behind us. Uh, our level of support is broad and is broad not only in terms of political influence, but, you know, backgrounds. I have people like uh, hopefully our next vice president, Kamala Harris. I have uh, uh, Maxine Waters uh, that has endorsed me. I have Senator Warrens. I have uh, Senator Sanders. I have our governor. Uh, I also have Patrice Collars as an individual, one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matters, who has endorsed me. I have the endorsement of the Democratic Party. I have the endorsement of most of the major clubs uh, in the county, uh, including uh, Black Women's Democratic Party of LA County, Young uh, African American Democratic Party. So we have a coalition of people across racial lines, across economic lines, across political lines. And we hope that, uh, you know, our story about, you know, bringing hope, bringing uh, reform, bringing reimagining the system, uh, and above all, bringing equity and, 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 and you know, pushing okay. against the systemic racism of the system is very important. And I hope that that will overcome money. Okay. I know uh, Ms. Lacey has what appears to be, or at least has been reported, uh, has, has been avoiding meeting with uh, members of Black Lives Matter. And I, you're not her, so I don't expect that you can uh, speak for her. But what's your plan in terms of connecting with members of Black Lives Matter and, and, and you know, holding police more accountable? Yeah, so I, you know, I've already met with members of uh, Black Lives Matter. And I, as I indicated earlier, Patrice Collars, on her personal capacity, not as a member of the group, uh, has endorsed me. Um, and I plan to meet if I were to be elected. And by the way, I fully expect that Black Lives Matter and other organizations are also going to protest against me. I think that there will be times when I'm going to make decisions where we're going to disagree. But that should never be a condition for having personal meetings. And I hope to have uh, regularly scheduled meetings with them as well as many other organizations um, because I don't think you can co-govern unless you bring all the various factions of our community together. And members of the Black Lives Matter LA organization have valid information. They have justified anger and they certainly deserve a place at the table. And again, I know, I fully expect them to demonstrate against me 
if I were elected at some point, because I know that we're not always going to agree, but that's not a precondition to, to getting together and doing so regularly. Okay. Now, I mean, let's just get straight to it, uh, George. I mean, you're, you're a former police officer, former chief of police in, in two uh, municipalities. You worked here in Los Angeles for many years with the LAPD. You show up in the world. Yes, you are Cuban, but you appear white. Um, many of the grievances that are coming from uh, folks are black and brown people. What makes you any better than Lacey? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm actually really glad that you asked that question, James, because I think it's, it's, it's beyond race. And you're absolutely right. Certainly, you look at the color of my skin. Uh, I look white. Um, you know, uh, my family immigrated here. We struggle like many other immigrant families, but I, I get the, the, the physical appearance. But I think that what is important is, uh, and I'm going to, you know, kind of, you know, sort of paraphrase Dr. King, you know, about, you know, judge me by the, the, the strength and the moral of my character, not by the color of my skin. And I think is look at the work that I have done. Look at my own personal evolution. Look at where I came from, what I've done throughout the years. Look at the work that I've done as a district attorney. You know, people refer to me as a grandfather, or sorry, the godfather of progressive prosecutors, and they do so because there is a body of work there fighting against the death penalty, being a co-author of Prop 47, creating tools to remove race, artificial intelligence to make sure that when the prosecutor is looking at a case, they don't know the race of the people involved. No one, the police officers, the witnesses, the the victim, the assailant, and they have to make a decision without knowing the race before they open up. And that first decision is actually locked in and it's available for review by others. Uh, automatic expungement of criminal records, commitments to, you know, having been the first district attorney that went into San Quentin in 2012, sitting down with lifers, being part of Prop 36, having formerly incarcerated people working in my office, having the most diverse office in the state, and not because I said so, but because Stanford Law School went out and did a, uh, an analysis of all the uh, DA's offices in the state, and we were deemed to be the most diverse office in the state uh, of large offices. So I well, say well, to let me, you- Let me ask, because I yeah. know we're gonna, we're gonna push through this. What do you say to your critics to say you've never tried a case? You know, how, you know, how, it, how are you qualified to actually, I mean, this is the largest county in the United okay. States by population, you're you, as potentially having impact on the largest county jail system in the United States. You super, you would be supervising the largest prosecutorial office in the United States, but you've never tried a case. How, how, does, that, how does one do that? Yeah, you know, actually very easily. When you walk into a, a airline counter, uh, I know that, Hardly anybody will ever ask and say, has the CEO actually flown a 737? But the reality is that most of the people around the airlines have never flown a commercial airliner. But they are there because they have proven themselves to be effective executive that can run that organization and do so profitably. I have a long track record of running organizations, large organizations, and doing so successfully. I was the DA for nine years in San Francisco. I brought crime down. I was able to lower incarceration. We had the only county jail with consistently somewhere around a 30% vacancy. LA County incarcerated four times the level that I did, and yet crime is up by 30%, violent crime. LA County is plagued, plagued by lawsuits internally, women of color for suing successfully for racism, for sexual harassment. We did not have those problems in San Francisco. You're not hiring a trial lawyer you are hiring an executive to run the largest prosecutorial office in the country. And if you measure the success of a leader by the capacity to get work done through others, then I think I would be far superior than the current occupant of that office. Okay, so a lot of people are saying on the other side, the, the police side or police supporters, that uh, this anti-cop, anti-law enforcement uh, rhetoric, if you will, that, that we hear uh, increases situations where we have ambushes of law enforcement or crime in the city or violence in the city increases because police uh, pull, pull back. 
Do you share that uh, that opinion, or what are your thoughts on that? Look, I don't. I think that obviously we need to lower the, the tone of the, uh, the incendiary language, uh, starting with the White House all the way down. But you raise a really important point at the beginning of this program. And as you and you ask a question that many people ask and that I that that I agree with, we need to begin. All of us need to be angry when violence is visited upon any human being. Right. But when we are only loud, when police officers get injured, which is a tragedy, by the way, and I do not condone it whatsoever. And I, you know, the individuals responsible for that should be brought to justice. But we should have the same level of anger when a, an unarmed black person uh, gets killed by police and there's no clear reasonable reason why that occurred. So that anger has to be equal and we all have to be able to say with a straight face that we care about everyone on an equal basis. And until we do that, you know, you're going to see some of this language. And I think that, quite frankly, as, as public officials, we have a higher responsibility of keeping civility in the conversation. Uh, certainly, if I, would be, if I were to be elected district attorney, I would hope to be a leader in that conversation. But I think it's, it's important to understand why people are angry and not dismissing that and then saying, oh, well, you know, you're, you're raising the level of violence here when there are so many other people in the community that have been, you know, arguably okay. uh, unjustifiably killed and, and you don't see the same level of anger coming from law enforcement. All right, let's, let's switch up gears. I got a couple more questions to get through. Jared, we are gonna go just a little bit over, so uh, please bear with us. Uh, I wanna set up this next video. It is uh, the alleged executioner gang out of the Compton Sheriff's Department Division. Let's go ahead and roll that video in and we'll talk with George on the other side. Now to more on an Eyewitness News investigation, the alleged sheriff's deputy gang that has branded its members the executioners. Today, city leaders in Compton say they're fed up. They're calling for a federal investigation. And as Carlos Granda reports, the mayor of Compton herself is speaking out about her own harrowing experience. They terrorize the community and then they cover their tracks. It is unacceptable. Is the Compton Sheriff Station being run by the executioners, a gang of rogue deputies with matching tattoos? Sheriff Alex Villanueva denied it last week, but today Compton's own mayor, Asia Brown, shared her own experience being pulled over by Compton deputies in June of last year. And I rolled the window down and asked why was I being pulled over? Within seconds, almost seven to, to nine sheriff's deputy vehicles descended upon the scene. They ordered me out of my vehicle and they asked me to put my hands on top of the police vehicle so they can search me as if I were a criminal. Mind you, I was accompanied by my husband and my infant daughter in the back seat. I do not look like someone that is trafficking drugs. I was in my family's family vehicle. Her baby crying, her husband and car search for drugs. Asia Brown says deputies let her go after they realized she is the mayor. But and welcome back. Just two more questions for you, George, because uh, we're hard up on time. How can the public trust you as district attorney to actually investigate the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, specifically the uh, Compton Division and this alleged uh, gang of executioners or executioner gang, uh, gang? Should the DOJ be called in? If, if not, are you willing to call the DOJ in as an independent body to look into this? Yeah, so, you know, history matters here, right? And I think it's important that uh, that hopefully the voters will look at my track record. They will look at the, uh, the Blue Ribbon panel that I implemented to investigate the San Francisco Police Department when I found out that we had uh, a series of very racist and homophobic text messages that were being traded by San Francisco police officers, which led to my dismissal of thousands of cases. I think the creation of the Independent Investigation Bureau that I did, the fact uh, that I uh, was the only district attorney actually that, that lobby to create law that will strengthen our ability to review police use of force. Uh, I think those are all matter, but I think that the other part that is important is I think that uh, also it matters to, to bring other, other, uh, other forces to the table and I would be very willing and have been very willing in the past to work with the Department of Justice. In fact, every single shooting that we investigated 
from 2012 onwards, I share entire investigations with the US and the California Department of Justice because I wanted to make sure that we always had some oversight and, and if there was a difference of opinion uh, that that would be shared with us, we never saw one. But I say all this to say, I think it's important DOJ be part of the investigation. I think it's important also that the district attorney be part of that investigation. You know, the uh, sheriff, Sheriff Illinois, is, there's been whistleblowers that have come forward and uh, made some allegations against the department. So how are you going to cultivate an environment for both law enforcement, prosecutors, uh, uh, public defenders, all of the kind of ecosystem that you work in because the buck stops with you with charges. So uh, how can whistleblowers feel safe coming forward and complaining about either the sheriff or the district attorney and not be in a situation where like the sheriff makes a tax and just calls them greedy. Well, and by the way, it's not just sheriff, right? I mean, we've seen that in the district attorney. We've seen whistleblowers in the DA's office being shut down, being ostracized and being retaliated again. And that's why there are so many lawsuits against the current DA. Uh, look, you have to walk the talk. Not only do you have to be open to criticism, you have to create vehicles for people to either come to you or to go to others and be critical of your work and have the courage to be introspective when it has to do with you. When it has to do with other people in the ecosystem, you have to be willing to take that information and act upon it. Look, that information is not always going to be necessarily accurate, but you have to treat it and you have to affirm the process for the information to come to you, and you have to give it the due attention. We did that in San Francisco with the Independent Investigation Bureau, where we were you know, you know, getting people to come to us sometimes anonymously, not always information you can act upon, but people need to feel free uh, to be able to complain without the, you know, without any specter of retaliation. And that has to work both internally in your own organization, meaning the VA, as well as other members of the community and law enforcement have to feel comfortable they can come to you and they're going to be protected. All right. We're going to park it right there. So Jared is telling me we're hard on time and we got to get out of here. Um, I pr appreciate you taking some time and talking with uh, me and the audience today. My guest today has been uh, George Gascon. George is the candidate, and he's in a very contentious and heated runoff for the district attorney's office here in Los Angeles. The election is on uh, this November 3rd. Uh, make sure you register to vote. Get somebody registered to vote. Cast your vote. You only got two choices. We get what we get, and we don't get to complain if we don't vote. Till we have another opportunity to speak with you, as always, agape.